thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction. And um, thanks a lot for this opportunity to talk about uh, our new book, Rallying for um, Immigrant Rights. Um, I want to set the stage for our comments today um, by thinking back to the spring of 2006. And first I should say that I'm going to start, and then I'm going to have uh, Irene come up. Uh, so I'm going to do the first part of this talk, and then she's going to do the second. So. To make all, to set the stage for all of that, let's think back to the spring of 2006. Um, between mid-February and uh, early May of that year, an estimated uh, 3.7 to 5 million people um, took to the streets. <coughs> and they did that largely in uh, three waves. There was one in, in late March, one in early April, and then one on May 1st. And these um, protests took place in at least 163 cities uh, uh, across the uh, U.S. in almost every state. There were upwards of 260 demonstrations during that time. And they took place in places that were big and small, um, ranging from places like L.A., where there was a very large, that was just one of the protests, 650,000 people, to Anchorage, Alaska, where there were 24. And they um, were often the uh, largest in the town's history, including in places like Chicago, Denver, Fresno. Um, and in addition, they took place across uh, a, 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 a large, a broad geographic span, so that we, there were waves of protests both in places where we would expect and were well known for lots of activism, and also for immigration in recent decades, and those that were known for neither. So not only in places like LA and Chicago, but places like uh, Nebraska and North Carolina. Now the immediate catalyst for um, these uh, protests was, as probably everybody in this room knows, um, the Sensenbrenner um, bill, uh, also known as HR 4437. And um, this bill, would have put much more dollars into border um, security, and it would have made living in the U.S. without documentation a crime rather than a civil offense, and it would have additionally criminalized anyone who offered legal aid, social welfare, or sanctuary to undocumented um, immigrants. It was a draconian bill that followed in the wake of um, anti-immigrant um, federal legislation since 1996, and here in California as well, um, uh, uh, several of the um, propositions, like 187 and 209. So it, it, it was very draconian following in the wake of increasingly um, hostile uh, legislation around immigration. Um, but also, for those who wanted to reverse uh, this anti-immigrant trajectory, um, the introduction of the Sensenbrenner Bill was an especially bitter moment because it followed the very hopeful developments that had happened in 2001, um, where it looked after a meeting, like it looked like after a meeting between um, Vicente Fox and George Bush, that it might be possible to actually have um, some uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform, and that hope, of course, ended with 9/11. And then came the sense of brand bill. So this is really the immediate um, uh, backdrop to it. And the protest, the very large number of protests that I've just talked about that followed in the wake of HR 4437 were noteworthy in several respects. Um, first of all, they were larger, the, the sheer scope of the demonstrations were of historic proportions when compared to the past moments that are very famous in the annals of U.S. contentious politics. So they were larger than the March on Washington um, in the heyday of the Civil Rights Movement or the anti-war protests during the Vietnam era. They were larger, too, than the protests that took place in Haymarket Square in 1886. And as a labor historian, you know, that's one that, that is very, uh, very plays a big, uh, has a big place in my heart. Um, and interestingly enough, was um, one that also gave the world May Day, which the last uh, protest, uh, the last round of protest in 2006 hearkened back to. Um, so the sheer scope make it note noteworthy. And here you have a picture of the, of the Haymarket. I just couldn't make them both come on the um, same slide. Um, but they were, they were also notable for their peacefulness. They were, and so that's in contrast to Haymarket there. 
Um, uh, they were without a major incident. Nobody died. No police cars were burned. And that, that is uh, in contrast to other large demonstrations um, in recent decades around immigration and race, like, for example, those that happened in essentially the same period of time in places like Paris or Sydney or Birmingham, um, England. In addition, they're very notable for their focus on non-citizens. The protests uh, were um, animated by and by people without citizenship in the political system that they were challenging. Most studies of formal politics take for granted the citizen actor. Studies of social movements also assume a protesting citizen, often a second class citizen, but not ones who can be thrown out of the country um, just for their protest activities. And Irene will say more about this in a, in a moment. But the thing I want to emphasize here is that this focus on non-citizen immigrants stands out when you compare this moment of protest to earlier protest movements. And that's true even when we consider the Chicano Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, including the UFW, or the Chicano Student Movement, or the Chicano Nationalist Movement. In retrospect, that wave of activism provided a historical touchstone for the protest of 2006. And they also forged a generation of activists, some of whom were involved in the protest of 2006. But these earlier moments, um, these earlier movements revolved around the concerns and aspirations of US born citizens of Mexican and Chicano origin, not around the concerns and aspirations of immigrants. And as is well known with the UAW, for example, there was even a period when they were actually, um, it was really more like anti strike breaker, but they were not um, speaking for immigrants largely. Okay, so. Um, one of our primary goals in the volume is to under, understand and explain the scope, scale, and peaceful nature of the protests, for they don't fit in our standard models of uh, political behavior from um, uh, political science, science scholars that usually focuses on regular conventional political action, like voting or contacting local leaders. At the same time, the protests don't really fit within contemporary social movement scholarship very well either. While the strategies used were tried and true, tactics employed by past social movements, the nature of the 2006 protests were unusual. They ballooned to unimagined proportions, were sustained for about three months, but then collapsed as quickly as they had started. There have been um, May Day protests in subsequent years, but nothing um, on the order of the 2006 protest. So we, were, we wanted to know why this happened and what it means, both for our theories of contentious politics and for our understanding in general and as citizens and activists for the consequences of protest. Um, there is a, for, because of that sort of dramatic um, up and down, and, and here you see my nice pictures, right, where this is, this is like uh, part of Chicago where there's a big protest and then there's a picture where there's nobody there. Um, uh, because of that big dramatic um, uh, cycle of protest, there's a big debate over whether they better represent spontaneous collective action, which was articulated as what social movement scholars studied by an older generation of social scientists, or a sustained movement in line with most contemporary theories of social movements. And so that's one of the questions that we take up in the book, and I'm going to address it. But first I want to pause for just a moment and tell you a little bit more about how the book came about and how we organized it. So the idea for the book originated um, during the protests themselves in 2006 as part of an email exchange between myself, other social movement scholars, and Roberto Suro, who was then of the Pew Hispanic Center, who was wondering if it would be really possible to get questions out there in the field during the, during the, the uh, course of the protest. Um, we were all asking ourselves how to understand the protests we were seeing and realized that we needed to foster research if we were to understand really what we were seeing. So I joined forces with um, Irene Blumrod and we organized a conference in the spring of 2007 to take stock of what was happening. And from the start we thought we really needed a multidisciplinary group of scholars, largely because as I just explained, the protest didn't really seem to fit existing models very well. And with the support of um, 
we, we did the, we organized a conference with the support of Early, the um, Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. <coughs> and our organizing principle during that conference was to focus on what happened in several different places and to ask our contributors to investigate the various institutions and processes that might have been involved in the protest. We also invited scholars to the conference who would look forward and try to analyze both the short and possibly longer term consequences of the protest. So we're going to talk about both of those parts today. So let's now that you have that background, let me return to the question of spontaneity and to offer a few highlights of what we learned about mobilization dynamics. These highlights come from our first chapter, um, where Irene and I, along with Teku Lee, drew on the case studies presented in several of the chapters to build an account of how and why the protests mushroomed and spread so rapidly. So, this is going to be now about understanding mobilization, as you anticipated. Okay, so let me say a little bit more about the uh, long debate in the social movement field about whether protest is typically spontaneous or generally built on prior organization. And, this is something that you see often played out um, in the newspapers, for example, or if we think back to um, the civil rights movement, it's been much disputed and fought over. Rosa Parks, was she somebody who was just tired and uh, uh, of sitting in the back of the bus and stood up, or was there an organization behind her? Um, there is often a narrative of spontaneity in uh, social movements. If we think here about the work of, um, for example, Francesca Paletta, who s talks about the way in which activists often tell a story about their activism, which relies on, and then I just got so angry, then I just, I couldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't put up with it anymore. And that, that's a very dramatic, compelling story, and that sometimes we take it at face value, and that if you look more closely, you see that that's not always the case. But in the case of the 2006 protests, um, uh, there is, you know, I think that that's a reasonable question you might ask, not only because they mushroomed so quickly, but also because there was a puzzling lack of national organizations that played a central leadership role in the protest. In addition, there were new elements in the protest mix. The Spanish language media and texting, um, which animated the protest, has generated a lot of attention both at the time and since. So many stories appeared about the protest in, that appeared about the protest in 2006 emphasized the role of Spanish language DJs and of texting. And we think that clearly these played a role, but based on what we learned from the cases of the cities in the first part of our book, we argue that the mobilization of, 2000, of the 2006 protests was not spontaneous but relied instead on the leadership played by local groups that came together in varying coalitions in different cities. And this varied by the cities. Um, often there was a labor union involved, a church, community-based organization, but they were different ones in different places. <clears throat> and so we believe that the rapid mobilization of the protest is actually parallel with what two sociologists, Andy Andrews and Michael Biggs, have recently discovered about the 1960 sit-ins for the civil rights movement. They show that the sit-ins spread rapidly where newspapers provided information about what had happened in other places and where there were then local activists who were able to quickly take advantage of the publicity because they did not have to wait for approval from national leaders. We think that something similar happened in 2006. But we also wondered how these varying coalitions came together so rapidly and were able to pull off demonstrations that were much, much larger than any of the sit-ins in the 1960s. And in one of our chapters, the journalist uh, Randy Shaw hints of one possible answer, that the immigrant worker freedom ride <coughs> fed rapid localized mobilization. The rides, as maybe maybe some of you, maybe all of you in this room <laughs> might remember, were modeled after the Freedom Rides of 1961. And they were hardly noticed outside of the progressive community in 2003 when they took place. But one of their key aims was to boost working relationships among labor unions, community organizations, religious, student, and immigrant rights groups in the communities where buses stopped. Okay? And so those, there, there's a root of, of where the um, um, Freedom Rides uh, went. So to investigate Shaw's suggestion, we overlaid a map 
of the route of the Freedom Rides with the cities where protests occurred in 2006. So you remember this map which I showed you before, right? Okay. And so those are the places where the Freedom Rides uh, stopped. Um, and uh, in fact, um, these, this map, there over two-thirds of the cities where the buses stopped in 2003 had protests in the spring of 2006, supporting the claim that the rides helped to build the coalitional infrastructure that served as the background of the movement. But while labor was one key group, others were also important, and we have chapters that look more specifically at each of those. So, you know, I said earlier that, you know, it depended on the, the, the city, so um, and which groups came together. So the way our um, chapters are organized, we have a chapter on um, the media, and especially um, the Spanish language radio and the LA uh, DJs, which does a very nice job of, of charting the ways in which the DJs um, raising support for, like, community disasters actually um, came more and more to cooperate with each other and do this kind of community um, outreach. And so uh, they were, and the syndication of those shows um, across the country following the immigration streams made the, be the media very well placed um, to uh, help spread the word um, uh, about 2006. Um, we also have a chapter about the role of the Catholic Church honing in on LA, which makes the very interesting uh, point that we all know um, about uh, the, the, um, uh, the Catholic priests that were often involved in some of the uh, uh, protests. But in, um, in LA, that was, they, they were a key actor as well. But in addition, this chapter traces the way in which in the past, when the Catholic Church had been involved in, in politics or um, in any kind of uh, support for immigrant rights, it had been focused largely on legislation and on sort of normal political channels. But that, that really shifted leading up to the protest of 2006, where there was much more um, of a willingness to actually push contentious uh, action. Um, we also have a chapter about the um, hometown associations in um, uh, Chicago um, that shows their key role in that city. Again, in, in, in these sort of different local uh, coalitions. So it's, it's the same story, but different key actors are playing the role in these different places. Um, we have, in addition, a chapter about advocacy organizations and community-based organizations in Denver, which does and, and Irene may talk a little bit about this, that does a very nice job of, of, of um, tracking how these, these groups not only um, uh, organized the protest in Denver, but that over time, as they, as they went on, responded to the very negative publicity around the initial framing of the protest. Um, finally, we have um, two chapters that focus on uh, families and schools. We have one that um, is written by two of the people here, uh, Irene and Christine Trost, that um, looks at the uh, Richmond, right uh, down the street um, from us, that shows the way in which schools were a key mobilizing um, uh, uh, organization, and the way in which children sometimes mobilize their parents to participate uh, in, in the protests. Um, and we have a, a a similar focus on families um, in Chicago and the way in which the, um, the, the protests there, the, um, the organizations in Chicago that were advocating <coughs> on behalf of mixed families um, play a central role, again, in framing the protest, um, the critiquing the United States um, and its, its, its understanding of democracy for uh, because they would then separate uh, families. So these are some of the other um, key uh, mobilizing structures that we talk about in the uh, book. And um, uh, they, there are these sort of local variations that would be fit that idea that um, it's like this the publicity provided by the Spanish language stations building on the infrastructure laid down by the Freedom Rides that united these different groups in the different places. Okay, so um, 
it's, it's these organizations and that earlier infrastructure laid down that allow us to understand how such massive protests were generated so quickly. So with that, I will turn it over to my co-author. Okay. One of the things that we tried to do in the introductory chapter is to have a real conversation between the social movements literature, which comes more, I think, out of sociology um, than perhaps political science, and the literature from political science around sort of normal politics um, and potentially the trade-off between electoral politics and court-oriented <coughs> strategy. So if there's a division of labor in the social sciences around issues of politics and civic engagement, I think in general the social movement side falls more on sociology and the <coughs> law and the courts and the electoral politics falls a little bit more on political science. And so part of what we're doing in the first chapter is having a conversation with those literatures. And we really tried hard not to do the standard chapter that you see in a lot of edited books where it's just like, and now you'll read chapter one, and they're going to do this, and chapter two is going to do this, and chapter three is going to do this. So we tried something a little bit more synthetic. Um, in terms of this, Kim has just talked about um, this question about, is the immigrant rights movement different or the same than other social movements, and perhaps the intersection between social movements and regular politics. And in a certain in a certain way, the story that she's told is that it is somewhat similar. Um, we find sort of on the bulk of the evidence from the chapters written in the book that there is an argument to be made that there were these mobilizing structures in various communities and though the mobilizations were probably far larger than a lot of the organizations that were helping to build this infrastructure ever anticipated, and I do think that the media and social media, internet, texting, etc. was extremely important, um, we still think that a lot of the insights from the prior social movements literature is germane. What I would like to now think about is, is there an argument to be made, and I don't think we have a definitive answer to this, so it's a little bit of an open question, but is there an argument to be made that a social movement or a political movement around non-citizen rights is different from other social movements? Do we have to understand it differently, and do we need different theoretical tools? Um, and I have to admit, even in my own mind, I'm not entirely clear what I think about this, but there are elements that make it seem like we need different frameworks for understanding it, and I want to walk you through some of this. Um, as a starting point, Kim mentioned earlier that most social movements, not all, but most of them, especially as narrated by sociologists, are about um, outsiders, especially disenfranchised outsiders, who are trying to get something out of a society or a political system, find the normal channels blocked, and then go to contentious behavior to try to make change. And so, you know, obviously the, the big movements that we often think of are the African American Civil Rights Movement, absolute blockage in terms of electoral participation, especially in the South, and so this movement to have to do something else in order to get change. And you can think of a number of other movements like this. Um, while there is repression for those populations who have second-class citizenship, and potentially this is equally applicable to a lot of the um, Arab uprisings in the spring of this year, um, these people are still in the current political system considered citizens and nationals of those countries. And so, yes, you can maybe kill them, you can detain them, you can put them in prison, etc. but you can't really throw them out of the country, which is very different, I think, when you talk about unauthorized immigrants, because states have the option of removing the problem in maybe not quite the violent way of just killing the problem, but getting rid of the people who are perceived as the problem. And an additional level, I think, is the type of claims that people have made in order to get inclusion. So when we think of a lot of the social movements in the United States, the claim often has been, we are second class citizens in our own country. If you believe in equality, if you believe in inclusion, you have to give us these similar rights. And you can think about the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement, um, the labor movement, you know, all of these are stories about people who feel that they should be equal to others and are making claims. And one of the ways that they can say that they have legitimacy is to be saying things like, we're American like you. So then the big question becomes, okay, when you have a population who is non-citizen, and in fact, in the eyes of many of the majority population, 
are in the country without the approval of the authorities in that country. Where do we get the legitimacy and the framing, and this is both as a political strategy but also a social cultural strategy, that you can actually mobilize a successful social movement and get political change. And so now I want to think a little bit through why a, a citizen, sorry, an immigrant rights movement, especially one concerned about those who have, do not have papers, why that might challenge some of the ways we think through social movements and political change. Um, and one way I'm going to do this is I'm going to walk through some of the framing strategies that you see in 2006. Right? So I've already talked about this, that um, a lot of the movements in the United States have made these appeals to second class citizenship, be it because people are workers and not property owners, but they feel that they should still be given certain rights. Um, women, um, and a lot of the demands that women have made, minorities in the United States, etc. And then, especially in a country like the United States, you would make appeals to democracy and equality. Now clearly, the kind of appeals people are making are also powerful, apparently, in places like Egypt and Libya and other places where there is you know, no established democracy in the way that we would think about it, but still there's this call for equality. And often it's on this basis that we are members of this society and therefore we should have these rights. Um, in the United States, this frame is not as available because of the alternative frame of illegals. Because by using the word illegal, you immediately are putting people outside of the system. And when we think about things like in the United States, like who has voting rights, People who are currently in jail you know, get, are put outside of that system. And so using things such as illegal and even just foreigner places them outside of the system. Um, Kim had mentioned that the chapter on Denver is really, really interesting because one of the things um, that, the, that the author um, is, shows in that chapter is that you know, there's this initial movement, especially early on in the movement, to use a lot of national flags. Um, so people would bring out their Mexican flags, um, their Peruvian flags, their Dominican flags, and for a lot of the marchers, this was a sign of pride. Um, and they would also have American flags, but it was clear that people were also having symbols from their homeland. And the reaction in places, not only in Denver, but in a lot of other places, was an immediate negative um, pushback, where it was like, the, the, the public perception, at least among some segments of U.S. society, was that it was just highlighting the fact that they were foreigners, and who were they to make claims on us when they are foreigners? And so you saw a very quick uh, change in strategies in 2006, where activists, community-based people, were telling marchers in advance, don't use your national flag. You know, you can put out the American flag, and they're even handing out American flags, but don't use, you know, the Mexican flag, etc. And then if a lot of you remember too, people started wearing white t-shirts. And so everyone was wearing white t-shirts. And I, in a certain level, it was a very smart and strategic message where there was a back and forth between the backlash and the movement in terms of how do we frame this. Um, in some places, you saw an alternative attempt to make a frame where it was okay to be foreign, it was okay to come from a different country by appealing to this land of immigration um, narrative in U.S. society, right? And so you see even among some uh, politicians who tend to be more restrictive on immigration, they'll still make appeals to the ancestors who came 100 years ago or 150 years ago and made this nation great. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the picture down here at the bottom, it says USA built by immigrants, right? So this is an example of that type of appeal where it's like, we're a country of immigration, we've done this before, this is what's made the United States strong, can we appeal to the past? And it seems pretty clear, looking across the different case studies and also just when you, when you look at sort of the media reports in 2006, that that had very little purchase among people outside the movement. That that just was not carrying weight in terms of a framing strategy or as a political strategy. Um, an alternative would be a human rights frame. And you often saw this. So no person is illegal. Um, we're all humans, we all have rights. Um, and if you think of the literature on uh, rights, especially as it's been articulated um, in Europe, there's been a move to saying that because of the increase in human rights, 
um, in the world, not just through things like the United Nations conventions, but also a general increase in human rights as a framing strategy, as a legal strategy, as a, le as a legitimate way that people think about um, you know, e equality among people, that there's been a break between the need to have citizenship and the need to have rights. So the argument has been that previously you might have needed citizenship to be able to access rights, but in today's age, we're having a break from that. And, and often that research was coming from Europe, especially thinking of the European Union. Um, some of you might be familiar, for example, with Yasmin Soysal's work. Rainer Bobach has written about this, David Jacobson as well. Um, interestingly, most of their work was done in the 1990s. And it seems, as, if, as Kim mentioned, that since the 90s, there's actually been an arc of returning to the importance of citizenship. Um, and, you know, I think the United States is a good example of that, arguably Europe is as well. Interestingly, you know, the human rights slogan as well had very little purchase in the United States in terms of getting sympathy in the court of public opinion in terms of giving rights to unauthorized. Um, I would also say that what makes this strategy hard, and this is where we really want to marry sort of social movements with more formalized studies of politics, the other thing that makes the human rights framework very difficult is in the United States, in the legal system, because of um, the, the way uh, the Supreme Court rules on various cases, the Supreme Court has drawn a pretty strong line between what it can interpret in terms of the Constitution and what is the purview of Congress. And the plenary power doctrine has basically set up so that the Supreme Court has said, Congress, because it's the sovereign authority in the United States, has ultimate say about who is a member of this society. So they can set up the citizenship laws, and they can set up the laws about who is allowed to enter, and also they can do deportations in ways that we probably would not allow for most other kind of judicial procedures. Um, and so the other thing that makes the human rights framework difficult is it, within U.S. law, it doesn't actually give you very much purchase on questions. And again, thinking about whether the immigrants' right movement is different or similar to other movements, we can think about key legal cases, for example, in the civil rights movement in terms of Brown versus Board of Education, that really were very important in energizing people and providing a playing field in which people could make other claims. And in the case of non-citizens, and especially those who don't lack author authorization to live in the United States, there's a much smaller area, I think, for this kind of activism. Um, I think I've mostly said that here's our picture of our uh, marchers who are now all in white. Notice by this time, they're all in white and you only see really American flags, you're not seeing any other kind of flags. Um, Another frame, and I think this one was particularly prevalent in California, but I'm not entirely sure, maybe it's just because I was here, um, was the worker frame, right? And this has all kinds of various articulations. So there's the we are workers, not criminals, um, and a lot of articulation about we do the jobs that Americans don't do, we're hard working, we contribute to the economy, if you didn't have all of these workers, the price of tomatoes would be double, um, these kind of arguments to, I think, gain legitimacy um, in, again, politics and, and, and in the court of public opinion, based on the contributions that these people are making to the economy. And there's a question as to how effective this is. Um, there's a long line of scholarship that suggests that in U.S. society, um, being a worker and being able to not be someone who is a burden on the state, for example, does give you standing and legitimacy and is actually a hallmark of American citizenship. This is this idea that you, you are someone who works. Um, so on a certain level, it resonates very well with um, different frames within the United States. There is a question, though, and this is also raised among activists in the movement, about whether this might not be a divisive strategy. Um, and it could be divisive for a number of different reasons. First of all, among the unauthorized population, it makes distinctions between the more worthy workers and the less worthy other people, right? So this could be other people who stay at home to take care of children or other family members. This could be people who are even, have been put in jail. Um, but, you know, if they came here at a young age and have been largely raised in the United States, we could have discussions about whether their criminalization or their, their, their actions were 
a basis of U.S. society. But it also can be divisive between other between immigrants and other minority groups because sometimes the subtext of "we do the jobs other Americans won't do" raises in, in, insidious divisions between the immigrants who are willing to work really hard and these other Americans who are somewhat nameless who will not work hard. And there's a number of activists in the immigrant rights movement who are very worried and concerned that if there's too much emphasis placed on the great worker that it's going to undermine, say, minority coalitions or other things. Finally, and this was interesting because I don't know, I definitely don't think I would have predicted this. It seemed, at least in a few cases, that one of the most effective frames to actually get a conversation going and mobilize people to participate was a family-oriented frame. And this could be sort of an immediate family frame, but also a larger Latino community frame. But what it did is it provided a way to have unity across different legal statuses. And here I think the idea of a mixed status family was extremely important. So a lot of the discussion in public opinion, especially I think among majority um, Americans who were born in the United States, the image of the undocumented worker potentially is a man working in farming or construction, but often an individual person, not a person who's a member of a family or a member of a community. And one of the things that, especially in the Chicago chapter, is really well done and, and, and an interesting um, way of understanding what was going on is by highlighting mixed status families where the kids are US citizens by birth and one of the parents was undocumented or maybe two parents were undocumented but there was an uncle who had legal status um, in fact representing the fact like many other immigrants in previous generations want to sort of close the door now that they've gone in and not really think too much about the next wave and this is across immigrant populations um, so this allowed some kind of unity, and you see in some of the work that Christine and I did and Heidi contributed to and others, um, that the discourse that was often used by the young people who participated in the unit, uh, in the marches, was we're doing this for our parents, we're doing this for these other people. So even if they were legal and they were born in the United States and this wasn't necessarily directing, directly affecting them, they would become, they would become involved. They also, um, in the Chicago chapter, the authors talk a lot about how this was also an appeal to American values. So if you believe that the family is a critical structure in American society, how can you tear people apart? How can you deport parents and leave children behind? Um, and then the appeal to innocence, the, the, the child left behind when a parent was deported. Now, this would be a potential way of framing the debate. Um, I'm not sure you know, in terms of political strategies, if this is going to be enough to get movement. Um, but it's interesting that this actually seemed to create a lot more mobilization and potentially maybe a little bit more sympathy than some of the other frames. Okay, now I want to think about repression. Same question, you know, is immigrant rights different or the same as any other movement? Um, you know, non-citizens are not only blocked from the formal political system, but they can be removed from the country entirely. Uh, I've already mentioned that. There's very limited recourse in the courts, um, shut out of legislative politics indefinitely. So if you're undocumented, there is no way you can become a citizen of the United States in any sort of near-term perspective or even medium-term perspective. And if you want people to talk on your behalf, you're going to have to convince other people to do that. Um, if you have U.S.-born children, you're going to have to wait until they're at least 18 to vote on your behalf, right? So. You know, maybe in 10 to 20 years there might be change on this if we have a whole big second generation who's coming of age and might want to take on this issue, but this is one of the issues. And then of course the possibility of deportation. Um, and I just want to highlight the deportation part of it because this might be one of the answers to the question of why did the movements collapse so dramatically. And I don't think this is only the reason, but it might be part of it. So after 2006, removals people um, deported from the United States has steadily risen, has continued to rise under the Obama administration. There has been a shift slightly to trying to remove more people who have been called criminals, but as um, a number of studies, including the one from the Warren Institute, suggests that a lot of this criminal activity are just traffic stops, like you know, having a taillight broken and, or getting stopped because you don't have a license because you're unauthorized, and then because you don't have a license, you get pulled into jail and suddenly you become the criminal and eligible for deportation. 
So we have a rise in removals. And anecdotally, um, we interviewed, uh, so um, a project that I ran, we interviewed people in 2006, and we went back two years later and re-interviewed people. And a few of the people mentioned sort of this increase in fear and increase in repression in terms of why, you know, why they weren't as excited or as mobilized as previously. Um, so thinking about both collapse and also what were the outcomes of the movement, where do we go from here, um, the short-term effects of the protest were potentially, I would argue, somewhat positive um, in that HR 4437 was blocked. And even though now that sort of seems like a, a pretty empty victory, we have to remember that if you look at the state level, there have been many, many states that have moved forwards with all kinds of um, provisions and laws that have tried to target unauthorized immigrants. Potentially, they're doing this as a backlash to the 2006 um, rallies. But at the same time, we haven't seen another sort of HR 4437 type initiative at the federal level. So as much as comprehensive immigration seems to be stalled from the progressive agenda, the more reactive agenda also seems somewhat stalled on the national level. Um, and I do think that actually the protests might have had a place, had played a role there. Um, Roberto Suro in his chapter in the volume talks a lot about how the voiceless and the invisible came out of the shadows and into the light. And a lot of the people we interviewed in 2006 really put a lot of emphasis and felt very, very emotional about the fact that they were finally visible and that they could finally speak out and talk out about these kind of issues. And so, for a lot of people, it had sort of a very personal um, importance to them. However, there was no comprehensive immigration reform after. There was a number of different attempts through the Senate especially. All of them failed. And so another reason maybe why the movement has collapsed is that people are losing faith. There's just really very little sense of any movement. Um, and one of the things that makes, again, immigrant rights um, interesting, let's say, is as much as you can push at the state level, so as much as, for example, California has passed a number of bills trying to help students who are AB 540 or DREAM Act students, an individual state cannot reverse the legal status of anybody in that state. It has to be done at the federal government. And so this creates a particular dynamic that might or might not be different from other social movements. Uh, if we think of social movements as trying to be a snowball cumulatively having one success after the other success, um, you know, this might be of a different order of magnitude because if you want an amnesty or some kind of program to a path of legalization, it must be done by Congress. There's, there's no other option really. Um, medium term effects look a little bit um, more negative for those who um, are, in, uh, are rallying for immigrant rights. Um, there's been a complete legislative blockage at the federal level. Um, immigrant politics have moved to the states and localities um, with mixed results. I think a lot of the press has been on the anti-immigrant um, legislation that's going through the various states and at localities. There's been some studies, though, by um, colleagues, for example, at the University of California, Riverside, that seem to suggest that there's actually been some victories as well. We just don't hear about them as much. So the, the, the actual success and failure of provisions might be a little bit more balanced than you might get from the newspaper accounts. But clearly, there's been a backlash. And clearly, this is playing it, itself out in, in very strong measures in some states. People have turned to the courts. So things such as SB 1070 in Arizona immediately went to the courts. And basically, every state law that has tried to target undocumented immigrants or any kind of immigrant has immediately gone to the courts. Again, based on this idea that it's the federal government that decides about anything to do with status, states aren't allowed to touch this, and there's right now a lot of jockeying about the right legal language to see whether states can actually do this kind of work. Um, this, I, this actually makes me somewhat pessimistic because I think the courts can block anti-immigrant legislation, but I do not think they're actually going to affirmatively rule in favor of expanding rights given what I said about plenary power. So this also might make it somewhat different from past, um, uh, past mo movements. Finally, Latinos' electoral weight seems to be increasing. People have argued that in 2008, Latinos were important to some of the victories um, in the, that election cycle. But there hasn't been a huge change. And um, one of the chapters we have is by Luis Decipio, 
who gives a sort of very pessimistic accounting of the future of electoral politics moving forward and basically says maybe the Latino electorate will have some very small role to play, but he sees in the medium term at least that reaction against immigrants is going to be stronger in electoral politics. So this leaves us with a big question about where do we go from here, long-term challenges. Um, undocumented status can only be changed by legislation, but the undocumented have no electoral voice. And so this brings us back to the need to integrate social movements with more sort of formalized political studies, because while, this is, while the importance of legislation is clear in all social movements, I think, um, given the precarious status of the people at the heart of this movement, it might have a salience that's even greater. Now maybe, maybe that's wrong. Maybe if I was someone who studied some other movement, I would say that that other movement was just central and important. So that's an open question. Um, and then we also have a question about whether the way forward is through piecemeal politics. You know, first can we get through a dream act at the federal level and then maybe that'll set the stage for the next act, which might set the stage for the next amnesty, or do we need wholesale change? And this is actually dividing activists on the ground, um, and maybe is another reason that we see the collapse of the movement. So if we think about the collapse of the movement, there's repression, there's the loss of faith and hope, and then there's also, um, I don't know if infighting is the right word, but like difference in strategy and goals. There's, there's a, 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 a clear and somewhat honest, but very deep-seated difference in what people think is the right strategy forward. Um, and then there's a question about capacity building. You know, clearly, <laughs> if we believe the first part of what Kim talked about, that you need organizational structures and you need these, these kind of institutional capacities in order to mobilize, one of the things that the movement has to think about moving forward is how do we do this capacity building? But how do you do that kind of capacity building when the population that you're interested in has very limited resources, has no legal status, and because of that, tends to have much less of all kinds of other things. Um, and so, you know, how do we do that kind of um, capacity building? Claims making and framing I've already talked about, so I think I'll end it there and we'll maybe have a nice discussion. Thank you. seeing some traces of that in, in you know, what we're currently seeing in the news with the Wall Street, uh, anti-Wall Street organizing where you've had, kind of for the last few years, uh, unions and other organizations, anti-foreclosure organizing, and yet somehow it blossomed in the last week. I mean, I, I don't know, it, can, can you say something maybe a little bit more general about, about like what that means and how we can uh, think about infrastructure and uh, spontaneity and, and whatnot. What, what are your thoughts on that? Spontaneity? Yeah, no, no, no. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think if you look at the um, Occupy Wall Street, the whole fight right now is about the sort of fear of building the, the sort of coalitional infrastructure, right? It's that it, we, some people weren't really wanting labor to get involved because they have much more capacity, you know, Etc. Others really worrying about co-optation. I mean, it's it's kind of striking that there was a big debate about tactics, but not exactly in that same kind of way in 2006. So, um, I mean, maybe some, but I, I, and maybe right here we're just at the very beginning of it, and I can't uh, really uh, say. Um, I think 2006, I mean, in terms of spontaneity, like, you know, like, how do you, how do you start a spontaneous movement is basically the question, right? Like, how do you start an Arab Spring? I don't know. Um, but I do think in 2006, there was the combination of this very draconian law, 
that really scared some people who might not otherwise go out and really protest. And I think the Catholic Church is critical, but also sort of a host of other groups like, you know, hospitals were concerned, teachers were concerned, because that second part of the law, which was if you even help an aid and a vet, someone who's unauthorized, you might indeed be committing a felony. That was, I mean, on one level, the people who sponsored that bill, that was stupid of them, because it, it, it expanded, it, I think it's a little bit the same as the argument about family. It expanded the target of the law beyond just the unauthorized and suddenly got all kinds of other people paying attention. Um, and then I think that leadership, so I think one was the really sort of repressive danger that was coming down, but then the other thing I would say would be leadership because, um, you know, and there were different nodes of it, but like, you, you know, down, down, in, um, down in LA, um, the Cardinal was really, really Mahoney. important. Mahoney. Mahoney. Yeah. Uh, was really, really important because you know, he brought in um, discussions of this, like in, in the Lent services and stuff like that. So it was giving, that was giving, you know, church approval for a lot of people who might be very nervous about mobilizing to that. Um, there were a number of um, faculty in the University of California system, especially around Riverside, et cetera, who were very active and started, you know, pulling in a lot of um, networks that they had. And some of those people were longtime activists, you know, back from the Chicano rights movement. And then I think the radio DJs, they also took on a lot of leadership. So I do think you need sort of, a, you know, but this is post hoc theorizing. But there you go. <laughs> but the, the other thing I would point to as well is that, you know, in the social movements field, there's often this idea that is kind of expanding political opportunities that really generate uh, movements. Here, it was, qu it was quite the opposite. Um, it's a little harder to say about you know, occupying Wall Street because part of this, you know, one of the big debates is uh, can Obama take advantage of this to push his jobs bill, which is clearly not what most people are hoping who are occupying Wall Street, right? So you have a different kind of politics playing out as well. In the United States, at least, a lot of the employers um, are not against legalization in some form or another. They might not want permanent residency, they might want temporary visas or something like that. But you know, the, the US Chamber of Commerce has as one of its um, sort of political platforms legalization. They, they have come out in favor of legalization for unauthorized migrants. So the, if you think about, um, you know, even if you think about the Republican Party, when it comes to immigration, you have a clear split between your Wall Street Journal Republicans, the ones who are the capitalists and, and, and don't necessarily have any problem with immigrants, and then your social conservatives, um, I won't name any names, but you can think of lots of people who might fit that bill, who, who are actually more on the social and cultural conservative end and really want to raise fears about this. And, and then we can get into a very interesting discussion is, is the backlash against immigrants what is fuel fueling the backlash against immigrants? And maybe it has a lot to do with race and xenophobia and other things, and it's not so much about the fact that they're unauthorized. I mean, that might be, you know, arguably it's either the reason, these people haven't followed the rules, or it's a cover for something else. Thank you, Harry, for the perfect segue to my question. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked You're about, welcome. We've talked a lot about citizenship and immigration and uh, status right. as being important and different in this kind of new social movement compared with others. Um, how do you see race playing in this multiracial um, movement where um, in a society that largely votes super conservative and white um, kind of in those directions? How do you see that playing into the movement and what, kind of what might be happening now? That's a very good question. I mean, you definitely see the framing of the immigrant as other racially right. by the conservative yes. side, but how were how was the immigra immigration rights movement itself thinking about or using or not? I think there's a, a difference. I don't have you know I I don't have enough empirical evidence that I feel completely confident in my claims, but. Based on what I know, um, that was a huge caveat, right? I was really trying to get this. Um, you know, among the activists, I would say almost all of the activists are very sensitive to and very interested in having a multiracial coalition. 
And if you look at like what went on in Chicago, they had Polish and Irish Americans or people of Irish and Polish background coming out to make sure to show that you know the unauthorized aren't just Latinos and, and or Mexicans, but they're also all these other people. Here in San Francisco and down in San Jose, they had people from the Asian American community, they had Filipinos, they, they there was a real attempt, I would say, by the organizers, the people who you know, really have a political savvy and are thinking about this to articulate this as not just an issue about Mexicans or Latinos. However, if you ask immigrants who are not themselves Latino what they think about that, I think that there is more of a perception potentially that this is really a Latino issue, um, even though, you know, about 50 to 56, I don't know, you know, we have to, 50 to 56 percent of undocumented people in the United States are Mexican, another 20 to 25 are Central or South American, which leaves you with somewhere between 20 to 25 other, right, from all over the world. Um, so, there, and given there's 12 million people who are unauthorized, you know, do the math, that's quite a lot of non-Latino unauthorized people. Um, but, you know, the people who came out, the ordinary people who marched, really were drawn from the Latino community. And um, what we were doing, uh, interviews while this was going on, or shortly after this was going on, and we asked people of the Chinese and Vietnamese communities um, in the Bay Area sort of what they thought about it. And most of them haven't really thought much about it at all. So they don't see it as their issue. Um, but the one thing I would add to that is that I think that the contributors to the book were much more interested in to what extent the 2006 protest either were building on more cohesion in an identity sense in a Latino community and to what extent they actually contributed to that. So that's more the issue that you know, was, was taken up in the book. But this is a, this is a good question too. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was just going to ask a question about um, secure communities and the impact secure communities may have had on um, stalling the movement. I guess what I mean by that is I think the Obama administration made a really interesting move in shifting enforcement or the talk about enforcement from kind of enforcement in a broad sense, enforcement specifically of uh, those who have who've had any contact, you know, authorize any contact with the criminal justice system. Right. And you mentioned before that uh, kind of criminality, the mark of um, criminal record, uh, has been a wedge in the movement. And, uh, from people on the ground. Um, so I just wonder if you could talk a bit about um, how the expansion of security, secure communities may have impacted uh, people's orientation toward mobilizing around um, the unauthorized and, and this movement we're talking about. I think it, it clearly has contributed to demobilization. I mean, one thing that I'm, in, I'm trying to get I read more involved in this project, but we're trying to look a little bit at um, the effects of the protests and this whole emphasis on visibility and how in some places I think that that played a really positive role, but I think in other places there's, a, there's growing evidence that it plays a very negative role. So if we think about the new destination um, uh, cities and communities, I mean the two studies that we have there suggest that visibility led to both a hardening of, of attitudes um, and both the 287G first and then the secure communities give um, you know, actors in those communities the ability to uh, enforce increasingly in the, in the state's draconian immigration law. So uh, I think that's part of what's happened in the wake of the protest. I, I would add on that one of the things that I think this is why the framing stuff is really fascinating and important is that I think democratic leaders in a certain way made a bet that because of the prevalence of this illegal frame and because of the language, they've almost to a certain extent decided that they're going to split the unauthorized population into the illegal criminals. And so they can sort of use illegal just for the criminal, quote unquote, side, people who have just been in some kind of contact with, with the justice system. And then on the other side, there's sort of the innocent, undocumented person who's a good person and therefore may be worthy somewhere down the, the, the line of um, legalization. And I think this is the tension that you see in something like the DREAM Act, where the people who could get DREAM Act and legalization status are the people who go to college or the people who go to the military and don't have criminal records. 
And so you're peeling off that kind of group from the, from, from the whole population to say, these are the particularly worthy people. And I mean, this is more normative than, than or political than social science, but I would be very concerned about that because to the extent that you have young people coming to the United States at two, three, four, if they're going to get into gang activity or do something stupid and get into contact with the criminal justice system, it's probably, you know, it had to do with the society in which they're living. But I think, I think what's happened, I think the same thing happened in the 90s with the Clinton administration and border control. So the Clinton administration made a clear decision that they were going to put resources on the border so that they could win the White House and take away some of this anti-immigrant sentiment from the Republican Party. But by doing that, they, they just perpetuated the importance of the border and the importance of securitizing the southern border. And I think the same kind of dynamic is happening where it's like, okay, we're going to take this issue out of the frame that it's usually, so we're going to peel off these people as illegal and everyone else is okay. But by doing that, you just reinforce this idea of illegality. Michael? Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering about, you didn't, you didn't say a lot about labor. Um, I mean, some, I, I, at the time, I thought that people were saying that there's some correlation between the movement and the location of labor centers. <coughs> is, this, is this just a story I heard that has no basis in reality? I mean, what, what is ultimately the underlying relationship? Well, I mean, in all of the communities that we looked at, labor was a key part of the coalition, the local coalition that built the movement. Yeah. And, um, now, yeah, I've seen the, uh, uh, the argument, too, about labor centers. I mean, one, one, one problem is, is that, you know, in a lot of places where there are um, immigrants, uh, there are also labor centers. So I, 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 I you know, and I don't have an argument about the way, I think the thing about the um, immigration freedom rights is it gives the mechanism by which that happens, right? The labor centers themselves don't. So it's, labor centers do participate in some of these places, but they're not, when you read the, the accounts of what happened in each community, they're not one of the key, the key actors in the sort of local coalitions that, you know, uh, recruit their members that um, act with others to set the date to, you know, get the, all the things you need to actually make the protest happen. So, there's just not that many labor centers, too. Yeah. I mean, if you think of the South Bay communities, you know, Mountain View has one, and, or is it, yes, Mountain View has one, and the, it, was, it was actually very active in 2006. But, you know, go to Richmond, and there's no labor center in Richmond, um, but it was the churches. So I have, thank you guys both for, for a great presentation, and I have one of those four black women two-part questions. So the first part is on the institutional side. Um, I'm just wondering if you couldn't also situate this more with um, previous kind of institution building that came out of the anti-immigrant war in the 1990s, not only California, but other places, but then and also the Central American Peace and Solidarity Movement, right? The roles of churches and those relationships that remain. And they're, they're still working to regularize status right after. 20 years, like to think of it. I think I actually really thought that was great to look at freedom rights, but those also came out of these relationships. And on some level, couldn't you argue that for the first time you have a national coordination across those groups that had never happened in all these previous iterations of movement that could be seen as, as institution building for the next iteration, right? They're actually talking to each other. They're fighting, but they're talking to each other in ways that they hadn't before. And it's related to the second part of my question, because I think people frame the marches as sort of having collapsed, and I appreciate that you have the positive, I'm talking about Sense and Brenner, but I'm sort of curious maybe to have a thought experiment, like, well, what would non collapse have looked like? And, and is it realistic, given how long the civil rights movement took, right. to say, we should have had comprehensive immigration reform by fall of 2006, or you were failed. You know, I, I just wonder, you can't have that level of protest. I mean, these folks had to work, right? Like, they're not going to be out in the streets every year for four years, so then what, what would success kind of have looked right? Like, <laughs> We're still fighting the feminist movement. <laughs> well, I guess you know, just to say that because the because the people right. left the street, right. is it collapse, right, or is it that it became something else, and and right. could it still be moving, right? right? Um, can can you, you take that second question first? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it used to we be like that one. We like that one. <laughs> and, and I would say that you know uh, there have been a couple opportunities to talk about uh, the book and. 
even before it came out. And I, I think our, our line used to be, yes, the Civil Rights Movement was actually a quite good comparison because you um, look at the Brown decision, then you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, then you look at the sit-ins, and there's, there's a number of years in, in between them, you know, and the, and the movement is sort of changing and whatever. But, but the longer it goes <laughs> since 2006, the, 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 the more I feel as if, well, I still think that, but, you know, it's harder and harder to make it. If you add an economic collapse, the loss yeah. of two-thirds of your income, plus this incredible increase in enforcement, I mean, I think right. there, there right. were real material consequences right. that totally. changed. It just seems like the other side has been so much more effective. I mean, things seem to be getting worse and worse, and not, and that is still... So, you know, we said earlier about uh, the way in, or I think in, in the answer to Pablo's question, I made a point that we make in the book, that this is sort of counter to the uh, social movement stuff because it's a, a movement of sort of, it's a, it happens in a moment of declining opportunities. Well, those <laughs> opportunities seem to be declining, 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 and yet we don't see, you know, it, this kind of protest. Now, you know, you might argue, and I think if you talk to church groups, for example, they say that they're going more on this kind of um, personal level, more like I mean, I'm talking to some as we were walking back from lunch, more like the gay rights movement, where part of the thing was to to sort of build support by saying, well, my son, my daughter, whatever, are gay, you know, why are you just so you know personally somebody who is gay, right? So I think that these church groups are sort of doing this sort of outreach to other churches and communities, saying let's come together and talk about these things. And so maybe we just don't see it. I mean, that's a very hopeful answer. Yeah. And Kevin, I don't know, remember if you were the one who said that, but um, someone pointed out that, you know, you could, you, if you wanted to say when this movement started, you could arguably say it was Plyer v. Doe allowing unauthorized children complete access to the K-12 system, right? And if you do that, then that makes it really interesting, because then you're like, okay, it's like Brown v. Board of Education, and that was in 54, and then it took another 20, 30 years. And so if you take that perspective, yes, then maybe this is just another iteration of the movement, and, and maybe we're just too close to it, and so we can't see it. Um, on your first point in terms of institutionalization, yeah. the one thing that I find puzzling, unanswerable, I don't get, is um, if, if I had to say, okay, you know, before 2006, where is the most sort of institutionally dense and rich place in the United States for immigrant rights, generally, not necessarily unauthorized, but immigrant rights, I would have said, LA, maybe San Francisco, New York. And interestingly, New York's mobilizations were really small given the size of that city. And San Francisco was smaller than San Jose. And so, you know, if you're thinking of, you know, like, the, the, the organizational infrastructure, why wasn't it bigger in New York? Now maybe the answer is just that the unauthorized population in New York is quite a bit smaller, um, and, and that's it. But maybe it, it speaks to issues about race and ethnicity and, and divisions between national origins and things like that. But it, it's, it's this, <laughs> Puerto Ricans have citizenship, and so therefore, right. yeah. And so it raises lots of really interesting questions about what, what do we mean when we talk about an institutional infrastructure. But I remember when this was going on, emailing colleagues in New York and going, why aren't you guys protesting? Like, what are you guys doing? And it was a lot like, well, we have no unauthorized Mexicans. And it's not, you know, that's obviously a huge exaggeration, but it's true it's that smaller. it's much smaller in, in sort of proportion to the total. But it was interesting that it was reduced down to unauthorized Mexicans in, in these kind of exchanges. Right. But I think you didn't have that history of organizations who've done immigrant work in previous Oh, like protest, protest type protest. Of work. Yeah, maybe maybe they've just been in such a nice place. New York's such a great place for immigrants that. <laughs> I know. I'm saying that. I'm just thinking about in the night, right? In the nineties, when you had all of the and you had the stuff with SSI and all that. You right. didn't have a lot in New York. But you also didn't have it in the South, and yet you have these protests in the South. I mean, I, so it's weird. Yeah, I mean that's why I think you do have to have this other piece of it. It's persuasive. No, I didn't say leave that out. There's other in it as well. Kevin, you had it? Yeah, so I wanted to maybe ask a little bit more about the like, your presentation when you sketch out like what are the short term and long term consequences of the, the uprising and kind of bouncing off of this discussion. Um, so it seems like in 2002 you had the protest. In 2007 you had the three backs really against Trump. In 2008 you had elections. 2009 you had um, 
and 2010 you had like Croatia and SB 1070 and crazy people in Arizona. Um, <laughs> and then 2010 you had UMAC failing, 2011 you have now like Yosemite and maybe 130, 131 in California. So like it seems like the movement has kind of parceled out into different avenues and people have been kind of focusing on different things in different locales. Um, but in terms of like CIR, confidence integration reform, and the future of an immigrant like movement, and even when we call this a movement, or we call this like separate people working together to achieve some of their goals, but necessarily, but not necessarily perhaps communicating with one another and, and working together, um, because there's no national umbrella or the nation that we just kind of leave this movement. Um, would you, one, call this a movement, and two, what would you maybe say about the future aspects if you do call this a movement, would it be, you know, what, what future steps they would be taking or could be taken in order to kind of solidify this and maybe get ready for a 2013, 14, 15 CIR um, bill or something that would be pushed for me another presidency and things like that after the election. I mean, just listening to your very adept chronology <laughs> of what's going on, I would say just on the basis of that, sure, it's a movement. I mean, if you if you if you say gay rights movement, stonewall forward. Or if you say feminist movement, name your start date, if you want to go back to the 19th century or whenever, you know, I think you can call it a movement. Like you can say, sure, there's now for the feminist movement, but like really, was that, you know, that was, it wasn't like the organization, right? So just, you know, based on your chronology, I would say, yeah, there's a movement. I think the challenge is that if the goal this is a question mark, but if the goal is legalization of people who do not currently have documents, the only place that you can get that done is through Congress. That's it. And like you can do all kinds of piecemeal things at the states, but you've got to get it through Congress. And that is unlike a lot of other movements where you can have significant gains at the state level. Because you know, you can get sort of Dream Act-like things in California, but it's only helping the very small proportion of people who actually make it to college without papers and there's like the whole slew of people who can't even get to college, not to mention the people you know, who are adults and, and not doing that. So my perspective would be that the, one of the challenges for this movement is that if that is the goal, maybe there's other goals as well, but if that is the goal, it's only Congress that can get it through. And so you need some kind of national movement. And I think the challenge that they face right now is that so many of the local actors are completely disgusted by the big national organizations. Like there's, there's a lot of tension between, say, a MALDAF, or in Naleo or whatever, like name your, your national organization and the people on the ground. And it has a lot to do with strategies and, and goals and, and the log rolling that goes on in DC. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what that means, but one thing that would be interesting, I think this speaks to Leah's question earlier, if at some point it got to the point that say business became really interested in this or some other actor outside of the movement became interested, then you might start seeing more movement on some of these things. And with that, though, I have to say, I did a perfect job of finishing exactly on time. Wonderful.